You know they don't like strange cats at the house. Not that you're strange. Ah! How are you with plaster, Stewie? Reggie's not so good with his hands. What? <laughs> That's not what you used to say. <laughs> Reggie! <laughs> oh my god, you are so disgusting. So sorry. Stop it, Reggie. That joke is not a little dirty for the kids, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay with me. I'll do whatever you want. It's just, uh... I was thinking it was more a joke for the parents. Stuart Little. My family album. Hi, I'm Stuart Little. And this is a picture of me. I'm four and a half inches tall. Even though I'm small, I still manage to get into all sorts of adventures. I used to live in an orphanage with lots of other kids. Mrs. Keeper took care of us. She tried to find the perfect family and home for each child, including me. The trouble was, nobody wanted a mouse for a son. Until Mr. and Mrs. Little visited the orphanage. There were so many kids to choose from, but Mr. and Mrs. Little said they looked at me and just knew. Just like that, I became Stuart Little. My parents took me to the most wonderful place in the world, my new home. There I met my new brother, George, who wasn't too happy to see me. I guess George didn't want a mouse in the family. And neither did Snowbell, the family cat. As soon as I walked through the door, Snowbell tried to eat me. My parents tried to make me feel at home. My room was already in waiting for me. Everything was just a little bit big for a mouse my size. Which made things very tricky. One morning, I was brushing my teeth when George accidentally threw me down the laundry chute with his pajamas. I ended up in the washing machine. Luckily, my mom rescued me just in time. I was one very wet and very clean mouse. Little by little, I started to really feel like one of the family. And what a family it is. All of the little relatives came to my party to meet me. It was a fairy tale come true. Everything was going well, except George still didn't like me. But he did like to build miniature models, and he had created an amazing miniature world in the basement. There was a train set, a western town, a miniature car, and an incredible model sailboat called the Wasp. George let me help him finish building the boat, and we entered it in the Central Park boat race. At the last minute, the boat's remote control broke. I sailed the Wasp and won the race. George had never been prouder of his new brother, me. Now everything was perfect, until Mr. and Mrs. Stout arrived. They said that they were my mouse parents, and they wanted me to live with them. With tears in my eyes, I packed my suitcase and left with the stouts. Little did we know that Snowbell and a mean group of alley cats had convinced the stouts to lie. They weren't my parents after all. My mom and dad told the police what had happened. It didn't look like I was ever gonna see the Littles again. But my brother George wouldn't give up. He plastered posters about me all over the city while I left the Stouts and tried to escape the alley cat's clutches and find my way home. In the end, it was Snowbell who saved me. He realized that I was a true little little after all, and he stood up to the alley cats and defended my honor. Now we're one big happy family. Fantastic. I hardly recognize it. Uh, hey, don't! No, don't look! No. This was all Stuart's idea. No, it wasn't. It was George's. No. Oh, ah. <laughs> Parker. Get that black. Okay. Stop it! <laughs> Is that good? <laughs> wait. Six ounces? No, I mean, wait. Six ounces. Hey, yo, I'm asking you. 
and don't breathe in my face. Stuart's parents died in a tragic cream of mushroom soup accident. Incident. Belonged to your great great grandfather, the late Jedediah Lewis. Lewis? Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my head. But you know, oh, come on, George, what do you say? Get me to a chiropractor ASAP. <laughs> Remove the film, throw it away. This is the kitchen where we make such foods as uh, Western omelets, mashed potatoes, and all varieties of meatloaf. And this is the dining room, where we eat such foods as Western omelets, mashed potatoes, and all varieties of meatloaf. A family dining table, where there's a place for every member of the family. A family dust mop. What, darling? Oh, I was just wondering if... The party was a horrible mistake. No, if there was any cake left. Cake. Ha! That's what I was thinking, too. Cake. Maybe you should... Talk to George? Check the refrigerator. Helen there. What if we're just... Horrible parents? I was going to say slightly overreacting. Frederick, we're trying to get to strangers. Stuart left with his real parents and never came back. Oh, no! Still rolling? Come right back in. Still right back rolling? In. Still, still rolling? Still rolling. Still rolling. Still rolling. Still rolling. Start, start. Okay, okay let's find the end position. And come right, and right there. there. Right there. Good. That's the spot. Good. We're set. Are you turning? Just do it. Here we go. Go. Oh no! What's on your mind, dear? Well, I, I guess I, I would like to know more about our family. Family? I'll tell you about family. Never trust them. I had a cousin once, a very... N no, honey, honey, not that story. He doesn't want to hear that story. M maybe later? We, we could have a family outing. Oh, a family outing. That would be lovely. I got it, I got it. How about we head over to the Italian restaurant? In the back, they have the most beautiful dumpster. 
We could all go through it together. One big happy family. Cannolis for everybody, huh? Oh, he doesn't want to do that. Nonsense. What son wouldn't want to dig through the garbage with his old man? Am I right, Stewie? You bet, Dad. We'd like to take down some information. Certainly. Name. Our name? Are you missing? No. The boy's name? Stuart. Stuart Little. Last scene. In the back of a roadster, uh, heading toward the park. Height? Three inches. Weight? Uh, six ounces. Weight? Six ounces? No, wait. I mean, stop. Let's get back to the height. Three inches. Three inches. Did we mention he's a mouse? No, I don't think so. Well, he is. Turn to the left. This image shows a stylized a diagram of the musculature of Stuart's head. This is really important to the model builders who are going to make all the face shapes that the animators will later uh, draw upon to do uh, to create Stuart's acting and his facial expression and his lip sync. This is a combination of the uh, musculature of a real mouse combined with uh, those of a human, just trying to come up with some sort of logical feeling for what the musculature might look like under Stuart's head. With conventional animation, the character can change his shape from a front view to a profile view, which is not the case with Stuart. He has to be photorealistic, and he has to maintain his volume. So once we've established where the muscles need to go in order to create expression, we had to put those muscles on a skeleton, which allowed his body the same consistency. What we had to do was connect, essentially, the hip bone to the thigh bone to the knee bone in a way that made it so when the animators moved Stuart, there were limits on where his extremities went. Now this is an example of all the different what we call face shapes to create a library of expression. The digital sculptors basically made these masks. I think there were 33 of them in total and then actually 66 if you count both sides. And this would allow animators to blend between different expressions or, or, or levels of expression to get a particular performance. And we made these masks so that his performance was always consistent. The contours of his face would remain a particular way from shot to shot just like a person has their own types of expression. Stuart would have this library to choose from. There were lots of other things that we had to do to Stuart. He was going to get wet, he was going to be blown by the wind, he was going to have to cry. So we had to create the fur elements in a way that allowed them to be affected by the physics of real life. In this particular case, you can see what we call clumping. Clumping was a method of putting the fur together in a way that would be appropriate were the mouse to be wet. Uh, throughout the film, the actors uh, had to perform to uh, basically nothing. There was no character actually there. We'd uh, rehearse the shot with a puppet, usually a stand-in stuffy, and then uh, for the actual take, the actor would have to play against nothing. So here you're seeing Gina on the, uh, you know, the final pass of just kissing the air, and uh, later that's where we'll put, put Stuart. This is illustrating the, uh, what, what's called the match move pass. There's been a uh, computer generated geometry that's uh, uh, been constructed to, to follow the contours of the covers, the pillow and the blanket. And uh, those are put into the shot and, they're, and they match the movement that we did of the blanket and the pillow on the set. And then later on we wound up enhancing that movement even further in the computer to make it even more convincing that Stuart was sitting in the bed and that he was pushed down into the bed as Gina kissed him. After we've uh, recreated the camera and the computer, we can then add Stuart in. This is a very simple uh, model of Stuart for the animator to begin what are just basically character sketches. And these are key poses. 
uh, to show, to give the director and Henry Anderson, the animation supervisor, um, a feeling of, of what his um, performance would be. And the, uh, the gray shaded object in the foreground is actually the sheet cover. And we have to model all those things to really give an animator the feel of uh, the environment that they're putting Stuart in. The critical part of putting the mouse in any given scene is matching the lighting and compositing. That means making the mouse fit over and under the pieces of the scene that are appropriate. In this case, as you can see, we have Stuart's head moving out of shadow into light. And we have the light sources positioned so they reflect in his eye in a way that's appropriate to the light that's striking Gina in the bed around him. We also have Stuart behind the blanket in the foreground and his hands move over the top of it. We distorted the surface of that blanket gave it little dents in order to fit him into the scene in a more realistic fashion. Here's Stuart brushing his teeth. Uh, you can see that uh, we don't want, again, the prop to drive the action, so we're actually uh, animating Stuart first, and then later we'll add the bristles on the brush. Uh, there's some extra def deformation that's going on around the mouth so that it'll feel like the bristles are bumping up against his lips, uh, as well as when he swishes the water around, we use some deforming tools to sort of pull his cheeks out and puff him out and make it look like uh, he's got water in there. This is particularly difficult. As you can see, each one of the bristles has to come in contact with Stuart's teeth, or the edges of his lips, and each one of them has to rebound and bend appropriately. This took a huge amount of time, and it's a relatively subjective issue as to how much the brush should bend. After the animation phase is completed, we would then begin color and lighting of the various components of the shot. This would involve lighting the fur, his clothes, the bristles, and the toothbrush itself. And you'll notice that the toothbrush is semi-transparent, and this was an effect that uh, we found from the real prop uh, on the set. There was actually a toothbrush in the original model, so we took that effect and actually applied it to the CG one. And here we've added the effects, the water spray. And it just uh, adds that last degree of believability uh, that really uh, convinces you that Stuart's actually here. He's holding an adult-sized toothbrush. He's uh, <laughs> gripping it in his own special way. And uh, he's going to work on his teeth. Costumes for our CGI characters were designed the same way the costumes for live action characters would be designed. In this case, this is an early concept sketch for Stuart's sailor suit. This would be reviewed by the director and studio creatives to come up with the exact design that would fit his personality. Here's the uh, Stuart fabric. This is an early test when uh, the guys that were doing the uh, sailor suit were just starting to work on it. We gave them a little sample piece of animation, and you'll notice that it starts in sort of a neutral pose, which means Stuart's arms are out to the side, and then it drops down into the animation. Because of how the cloth software worked, it actually had to complete a simulation from a neutral position into a position where it actually was moving, so that all the factors of gravity and friction, these various aspects, could all be applied. This test has an additional layer of clothing added to it. These are the pants. Actually, you'll notice the pants, the tunic, and the sneakers all interact with each other. And we felt that the movement of the cloth on his body was too silky, that there was no friction between his clothes and his body. And so these are the types of things we had to deal with when determining the realistic movement of Stuart. And this shows the sailor costume during one of the shots. This is where Stewart's yelling before the remote control gets stepped on. Pretty extreme movement. We also get a good view of his teeth. One of the things I, I should point out here, too, is that in order to keep Stewart's scale uh, small so that you felt that he was small, it's very important that the clothing moved as if it were doll clothing. So if Stewart had been six feet tall and he had yelled like this, you would expect to see that little tie on the front of his shirt sort of flop more than it actually does. We needed to keep those things very stiff so that they felt like they were only half an inch long. One of the things that was great about this show is that we didn't have to deal with motion control because if we had such accurate match moving, we could shoot scenes at real time. This is a background plate from the boat race sequence. We took a camera on a long arm and slid it out over a huge tank. This tank was 150 by 100 feet. 
and the backing, the sky that you see behind the boats, was painted on the wall of a building. This is the foreground boat element for the composite. Uh, the, the silver ball and the gray ball are reference devices for us to integrate Stuart into the scene. We'll use these to judge how the light falls on the scene. Uh, the human hand operating the boom will be painted out. It was for us the easiest way to make the boom uh, do that motion. You'll notice that the steering wheel is also missing. Since Stuart will be interacting with it, we will create that as a computer graphic element. In order for the character to have the appropriate motion against the background, in some cases, we actually manipulated the plate, meaning the scene with the boats and the sky and the city. In this case, we rotated the plate to make it look as though the boat that Stuart's on is leaning over. Here's the shot as it appears in the movie, and you can see between the last one we looked at, which was the first animation pass, and this one, we refined it a great deal. We had him start to slide more down the deck and spin the wheel faster and faster and faster to increase the frantic quality of the shot, and then really try to clamber up to high ground. And having that boom switch over at the top also just uh, helps to underscore his uh, dire predicament that the boat's really pitching over. Because digital characters are costly to create, and take a lot of time to create, the filmmaker has to be very specific about the shots that are necessary to tell the story. What did you want to, ask? to do this, we create storyboards, in essence a cut by cut in stills of the sequence's length. Although the filmmaker doesn't have to duplicate the boards exactly, they give us reference for the digital effects to know how many shots are in the sequence, how big the character is, what kind of costumes he has to wear, and what he has to interact with. Something's missing. I, I feel an empty space inside me, and, and I just want to know what was there before. Here is the uh, clean background plates for the sequence. Uh, you won't see any steward here. You'll see some interaction on the bed, uh, some phys physical effects, uh, approximately where Stuart's going to be. Uh, these were also sections of the film that we wound up digitally uh, enhancing, adding more um, deformation to the bed so it felt like Stuart was standing there, giving him more interaction with the covers. This one specifically, when he climbs up and here when he settles on the edge of the bed, we added a lot more deformation on the edge of that uh, that blanket so that it felt like his weight really pressed down, particularly when he gets really sad and he droops down really hard. Okay, here we'll see the gray mouse animation passes on the empty space sequence. The, uh, the body is a lower resolution body and the head is a high res body so that you can see, or high res uh, model, so you can see the face, uh, facial animation more clearly. Um, Stewart's interaction with the bed we were finding wasn't really convincing enough and so uh, we worked with the digital artist to put in some CG models like you'll see it there the blanket's been replaced and here by a by a digital model which will later be texture mapped and and lit to look exactly like the real blanket and therefore we were able to control more the deformation of Stewart against that blanket thank you thank you thank you love you Mwah. love you okay moving right along Okay, so I'll see you later, huh? I'll give you a call.